Hello and welcome to Frost Over the World. Later in the programme, actress Saffron Burrows, Northern Ireland's First Minister and retired firebrand Ian Paisley, and a Conservative Republican looks at the race for the White House. But first to Zimbabwe, where people are voting this weekend. With inflation over 100,000% and an economy in ruins, these elections are considered by many to be the most important in the country's 28-year history. President Mugabe, who's ruled Zimbabwe since independence, is standing for a sixth term in office. His main challengers are the former finance minister, Simba Makoni, who is standing as an independent candidate, and MDC leader, Morgan Sangarai, who now joins me from Harare. Morgan, it's great to see you again. We followed your fortunes in 2002 and 2005. This year, are you going to win? I have no doubt that uh, we will succeed. You will succeed in the first poll, do you think? You'll get over 50% in the first poll, or do you think you'll win on the second run? I don't believe that there is any basis for a second run. I believe the support we enjoy will assure us an immediate success without necessarily runoff. And this time, you've said you're getting a stronger response from the rural areas, from the farming areas, are you? Yes, all the meetings we have had, the support, there's been a, an upsurge in both rural and urban areas in terms of supporting. Of course, naturally, our base of support is in the, in the urban areas, but uh, we have also noticed a huge upsurge in the rural areas, and the consensus cuts across the rural and urban divide that there is need for change in this country. And it would seem from what we read here, Morgan, that this time there has been less harassment, less brutality and less bullying from the government forces. Is that true? Well, it's true to some extent. I think I must state that the environment is has been much better than it has been for the last three major elections. But that is not the only benchmark. I think uh, you have already heard about threats from the military, from Mugabe, threatening to subvert the people's will. So that is a bigger threat than the threat we have had of people actually subjected to violence and intimidation. So yes, there has been a reduction in the COVID, in, in the COVID violence that has characterized the Zimbabwe elections over the last three or four major ones. But uh, again, it does not mean that it's free and fair. And at the same time, what about the new, the new factor this time, which is that there is also a second opponent to Mugabe's, Simba Makoni. Um, now, it's possible that Mr. Makoni will take votes away from Mr. Mugabe. It's possible he will take votes away from you. Are you glad he's in the race, or is it a problem? Well, this split in ZANU-PF uh, is an opportunity uh, to us, uh, because this is a split of the ruling elite, and uh, the vote is actually going to be split of ZANU-PF supporters, but not necessarily to undermine the, the vote of the MDC. Uh, as you have noticed, uh, Mr. Marconi has not been able to garner uh, as much support uh, in the country because he's trying to convince ZANU-PF supporters to go along with him. So to us, this is a split of the ruling elite. It has nothing to do with the f objectives of democratic change. What is the f If you win this election, if you become president, what will be the first thing you would do, Morgan, if you became president? Well, first and foremost, I think that one must realize that uh, whoever wins uh, this election needs to create conditions for national unity and stability. For us in the MDC, we believe a national government will be a way of stabilizing the situation because there are so many people who feel insecure by a change of government. But nevertheless, uh, such a position must be based on the magnanimity 
of the people that you accommodate uh, other people from other parties so that you can create the necessary stability for the country to move forward. And what, talking of uh, being compassionate and so on, you said to me late last year at Chogham, you were saying that there's no room for vindictiveness or retribution towards Robert Mugabe, Mugabe and that he should, in fact, be allowed to live on in Zimbabwe uh, with people remembering his good years at the beginning rather than his terrible years later. Um, do you still feel there should be that relatively speaking, compassion I, towards Robert Mugabe if you win? Well, I think, I think the position is very clear that uh, if the Zimbabweans were able to reconcile with Ian Smith, surely one can still reconcile with Mugabe in spite of his, uh, his omissions. I think that uh, Zimbabweans will be able to forgive and move forward. I think the critical element here is how do we move this country from this current crisis of economic political and social decay, that's where the government has to focus its attention, rather than to be focusing on hate, retribution, and vindictiveness. And uh, of course, there may be people who will object strongly to that position. But for me, that is how I see the country moving forward. That's very clear. But it is also a, a huge task, isn't it? I mean, when you read these figures about 100,000 percent inflation and so on. I mean, how do you even start on a problem like that? Well, we are not, uh, we are not the first country that has faced such a hyperinflation conditions. I suppose there are examples that you can deal with. First and foremost, I think you need to uh, intervene to respond to people's needs for food, people's needs for medical care, people needs for transport and those kinds. Those are the short-term interventions. But to tackle hyperinflation, one needs a combination of fiscal and monetary policies as well as support from outside in order to deal with it and arrest it. But that is easier said than done. You also need to provide safety nets for those that are going to be affected by the reforms that you will implement. Because certainly, there will be people who will be affected by those policies. And what happens about... Um land reform, the land grab that Mugabe has uh, masterminded. Um, would you uh, intend to uh, reverse any of those land grabs or would you say the past is the past, we have to move into the future, the land grabs that he has made our our will, will stay? Our position, yeah, our position is that uh, certainly the method used by Mugabe destroyed the agricultural potential of the country and therefore created a food deficit for the country, which is quite unacceptable. However, we cannot go back to the pre-2000 situation land on land tenure system, which was uneven and unequal. We all agree there is a national convergence that some form of equitable national uh, land program is necessary, but it is the method of, uh, of resettlement, the method of land allocation, the method of agricultural productivity, that has to be addressed and it cannot be addressed overnight. Neither can it be addressed by reversing what has happened. And at the same time, in the same area, of all the white population of farmers who've left, would you like some of them to return and try and help build up the economy of Zimbabwe or is that again a case of where you can't go back. You've, you've got to leave that and go no, forward. No, no, no. Our position is that we believe that every Zimbabwean has a space uh, in Zimbabwe. Uh, whoever wants to live off the land, whoever wants to live with economic activity, is free to do so. But there is a process whereby Zimbabweans have to be allocated this land. And anyone can come and claim and actually be allocated land for productivity purposes. I am sure that there are some who may be accorded, accorded that opportunity through the Land Commission, which is an independent commission. But that should be left to that independent commission to make an assessment. But the fundamental issue is that every Zimbabwean, black, white, yellow, has an opportunity to make life in Zimbabwe. And there is space for everyone. And is it possible that 
in terms of the healing process in uh, Zimbabwe that you might you might decide to have something similar to what South Africa had with Desmond Tutu a truth and reconciliation commission a forgiveness commission in a sort of way is that a possibility I think I think it's necessary for the purpose of national healing and not for the purpose of retribution I think that when people say that the truth shall free you I think equally uh, donates to the fact that this country has gone through a lot of traumatic experiences and that you have to appreciate that the victims have to have a voice as well as the fact that the perpetrators have to have a voice under an amnesty, um, amnesty condition so that the truth can heal the nation. Otherwise, just brushing this side and let's say let's move on is not going to be the best way of integrating this society and actually reconciling this society. Well, absolutely, as you say there, in the words of the Bible, the truth shall make you free. Yes, right. Well, we thank you so much for joining us today. Um, it's a joy. Thank you for finding time at this crucial moment in your life. And we wish you all the best in the days ahead. Thank, thank you, Dr. Frost. Morgan Sandbride there on the eve of the most important election of his life and maybe Zimbabwe's. Ten years on from Northern Ireland's Good Friday Agreement, we'll be talking next to a man who opposed the agreement, but now sits there as First Minister. Ian Paisley, having undergone a tremendous change after this break.